Good morning and a very hearty welcome to Modern Philosophy class. Well, we begin today with David Hume. David Hume, 1711 to 1776. Yes, a very interesting philosopher. Well, you know, we had already seen what is Renaissance and then we entered into rationalism and then the next section was empiricism. Okay, in rationalism we found Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz. In empiricism, well, we have seen the father of modern empiricism, John Locke. Yes, and then George Berkeley. And now we have uh, David Hume. Preach, and then uh, Renaissance general and factors that contributed to the birth of modernity. Okay. Well, here too, Descartes is the father of modern philosophy and then he is also a rationalist philosopher. And then the rest of them, Spinoza, Leibniz and many others, carried on the major premises on which Descartes constructed his philosophy, namely Cogito. Okay, now John Locke, he is called the father of modern empiricism and then for him, yes, experience is a source of knowledge. We had seen it and all. Okay, here, reason, here, experience. Here, mind is endowed with innate ideas. Here, mind is TR, tabula rasa, empty, empty slate. And then, experience is the source of knowledge. We will be coming back again and again to John Locke until we finish David Hume. And then when we come to Kant 2, we take up these two sections of philosophy. So you'll get better clarity. And now what I want to say is that John Locke is the father of modern empiricism and David Hume is called empiricis par Excellence. Par excellence. In other words, he is the one who drew the important conclusion inherent in emphasis trend. So, in other words, he drew the conclusions, most important conclusions from empiricism. So, John Locke started, yes, he said experience is a source of knowledge, experience is twofold and then, well, internal, external, external is through the five senses and internal is called reflection and thus we form ideas. Ideas are a symbol in its nature and then the mind is capable of, yes, formulating going further and all that is with. And then he also made a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are found in the thing itself. Secondary qualities are depending on the perceiving subject and all that is namely color, smell, taste, etc. And then, well, George Berkeley came. George Berkeley started with uh, with John Locke 
and then he said well this distinction doesn't hold good the distinction between primary and secondary qualities why if secondary qualities are depending on the perceiving subject well let let me reaffirm once again if secondary qualities such as smell taste color etc depends upon the perceiving subject in other words the subject who perceives it clear well the primary qualities are also uh, depending on the and the perceiving subject namely the size yes it is you who understand you, you will get better light into this when we come to immanuel kant well i'm just uh postponing the major issue there okay but whatever, whatever it is you just think about it you talk about the smell of something the taste of something the color of something okay that is depending on the perceiving subject means the the perceiver the one who perceives or one who gets it and now the question asked by berkeley is a legitimate one in the sense you when you say that you see the color of this paper you get the you don't get the taste but then you understand what it is but apart from the size the dimensions how do you feel it or is taste it you smell it or anything for that matter follow a bottle you say about this bottle well you say the color of it and then what is inside and all yes secondary qualities such as color taste smell and all apart from the dimensions of it its shape how is it possible you have it so he simply said that the distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities do not hold good if secondary qualities are depending on the perceiving subject while the primary qualities are also in other words who makes a statement to make it little more clear who makes a statement about primary or secondary qualities and primary qualities and secondary qualities is perceiving subject and now we call david who a hume an emphasis par excellence precisely he drew the very dangerous conclusion implicit in the emphasis trend or emphasis philosophy now what is that let us carefully move primary secondary qualities we said depending on the perceiving subject or in other words while i go a little back again to john locke experience okay experience is the source of knowledge okay experience is two fold namely external internal external we call five senses in other words it is through the five senses you get the impressions who get you get okay and there is something called internal called reflection who does this activity yes in other words there is something called we have been talking about the mind is endowed with in, innate ideas according to rationalists and according to them i am going to make it as explicit as possible according to the uh, empiricist philosophers mind is tabula rasa empty slate and now into the empty slate empty mind experience falls 
and that empty mind is making reflection about. Therefore, therefore, yes, you listen carefully the record, therefore, David Hume would say, but mind is nothing but a stream of ideas. There is nothing called, there is nothing called mind. No matter, never mind, no mind, never mind. So in other words, you look at exactly as the ideas you form with the help of your mind, he would say mind is also an association. Well, you now reflect back to your first year, first semester, first year, second semester, and second year, first semester beginning. Look at the very dangerous conclusion, a drastic conclusion, a conclusion that is implicit in empiricism is brought out by David Hume. And now, once this is clear, his notion about understanding about the world, understanding about man is already said is an association and understanding about God will be similar one. So this is David Hume. We go, we go step by step into that. David Hume is over if you want. If you understand, De uh, John Locke and Berkeley, you understand extremely well also David Hume. That's the thing. So, please go through. Therefore, my request, I took more time about John Locke. Once you grasp John Locke, you're able to go and then with Berkeley. And that's why yesterday I did not say much about self, world and God. Because it's only, yes, you look at the mind, how it comes. Yes, now here, David Hume is drawing the conclusion. Okay, this is what it's all about. David Hume. And, but then, very stream, and stream of ideas, how does it come, and then between A and B and all, we will explain that one. Three relationships are there. A comes first, B comes later, and between them there is a conjunction. Yes, and all that is. That is how you form your ideas in your mind. Therefore, for him, yes, mind is also a stream, and there is nothing substantial. Yes, empty, empty mind is embedded with ideas. Ideas you get through association. That's the thing. So that is David Hume. All right. So in other words, well, we say something about, yes, David Hume is, notes, David Hume is considered to be an empiricist par excellence. David Hume is considered to be an empiricist par excellence, P-A-R, Excellence, E X C E L L E N C E, par excellence, because he developed to its logical conclusions, because he developed to its logical conclusions the empirical philosophy of the empirical philosophy of John Locke and Berkeley. That much enough. So you have already Berkeley and John Locke before you. Therefore, we go into the first part, namely the theory of knowledge. Now, of course, the first Roman division is about life and works. I already told in the beginning that it is an exercise given to you. Remember 
most important works of the uh, David Hume, John Locke, and all others. So that is the first point, and the second one is theory of knowledge. The first idea is uh, the theory of causality. So it is two, two, one. The theory of theory of causality cause. This is what he calls into question. Once he calls into question this one, the entire philosophical trend or tradition of about man, God, and world collapses. Clear? Also, in other words, yes, there arises doubt. Okay. Hume's most original and influential ideas, theory of causality. Hume's most original and influential ideas deal with deal with the problem of causality cause effect clear no the problem of causality cause causality so no some say causality but they will say causality full stop neither locke nor berkeley neither locke john locke nor berkeley challenged c h a l l e n g e d challenged the theory of cause the theory of cause yes nobody challenged the theory of cause now being challenged by yes david hume for Hume, the very idea is suspect. The very idea is suspect. In other words, the very idea of causality is to be doubted, sub uh, suspected. Okay, okay. Now, according to him, how does the theory of causality come to our mind? That's what we are going to explain. The idea of causality, the idea of causality, the idea of causality comes to mind, comes to mind when we experience certain relations. When we experience certain relations, yes, the theory of causality comes to the mind when we experience certain relations. What are they? How is it? That is what we are going to explain. Okay. So, relations between objects. Between objects, theory of causality. Yes, you you see the sun rising, and then the the time you walk through the sunny day light, you feel you warm, you are warm. Yes, you say the sun is causing. Yes, that is what the theory of causality. Now, well. The theory, the idea of causality comes to mind when we experience certain relations between objects. Cause and effect is like, cause and effect is like, cause and effect is like, yes, A causing B, okay. A causing B. Look at that sentence once again. The idea of causality comes to mind when we experience certain relations between objects. And now we are going to explicate that. Cause and effect is like A causing B. 
ഓക്കെ വി ആർ ഗോയിങ് ടു എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ഇറ്റ് ഡോണ്ട് വറി യെസ് ബിറ്റ്വീൻ എ ആൻഡ് ബി ദർ ക്യാൻ ബി ത്രീ റിലേഷൻസ് ബിറ്റ്വീൻ എ ആൻഡ് ബി എ കോസ് ഇൻ ബി ബിറ്റ്വീൻ എ ആൻഡ് ബി ദർ ആർ ത്രീ റിലേഷൻസ് കെ വാട്ട് ആർ ദ ഫോസ്റ്റ് there is a relation of continuity relation of continuity underline relation of continuity what does it mean put a colon so much don't forget between a and b there are three possible relations first of all there is the relation of continuity what do you mean by that yes a b c there is you are your mind is doing always connected with mind clear okay that's the thing a and b are always close together yes that's called continuity close together so a and b are yes there is a relation of continuity because they are close together there are nobody has found out any letter in the between so in other words yes okay that is one so it is, this is all happens happening in our own in our own mind okay secondly there is a priority in time priority in time what does it mean priority in time a comes first anyone in brindisi or in yani or in mf or in yes in ocd or in cm or in any house has found out any letter in the between a and b it is fixed in our mind you don't have it therefore therefore there is a continuity there is a priority in time yes which is prior a is prior a b c then a and b are prior to c that's the point well carefully go then you will understand the working of the mind okay secondly there is a priority in time for a the cause always precedes b the effect now a and b causing well when you put two items together cause effect then yes a causing b to come into existence okay always precedes b the effect and thirdly there is a constant conjunction there is the constant constant conjunction remember these three clear so there is a principle of continuity they are close together there is a priority in time yes a prior to b and then there is a constant conjunction that's the point okay what does it mean yes for we see a followed by b now whenever we perceive yes cause whenever we think about cause effect well these three salient features are inherent the principle of continuity the principle of priority and then the principle of constant conjunction because of these the mind is telling well the cause effect now you feel very warm you see the sunlight sun is causing sunlight is yes and the cause effect is coming now we follow the rest now carefully causality also connotes the necessary connection between a and b but neither continuity and priority nor constant conjunction implies a necessary connection 
So in other words, according to Hume, there is no necessary connection between the two. That is what he said. Okay? Implies, conjunction implies, yes, there is no necessary connection between object. There is no object, says Hume, that implies the existence of another. There is no object, says Hume, that implies the existence of another when we consider objects individually. That's the point. Okay, look at the sentence once again. There is no object, says Hume, that implies the existence of another when we consider objects individually. Library is library. Auditorium is auditorium. Classroom is classroom. Yes, you do these principles. You conject together. Continuity is there. Priority is there. Constant conjunction. Yes, you, you say about an institute of education. Yes, immediately you say, yes, an institute of education should have. Yes, classrooms. Yes, then library. And then auditorium. Then, what more? Yes, there is the playground and all that is. But taken library as such, there is absolutely, yes, there is absolutely no connection. And it is the mind that does this connection. Follow. So you see, now slowly we are moving into the mind. And when you come to Kant, you will see it much more beautifully and clearly, distinctly explained. That's the point. What is this mind doing? And therefore, I was so much impressed when Paul Zibi said about the ideas. Yes, ideas are in the mind. Yes, library, the idea of library is in your mind. The idea of Vijnanandalem is in your mind. You cannot carry Vijnanandalem along with you. But you carry along with you Vijnanandalem wherever you go because you have the idea of it. How did you get the idea of it? In space and time that when we come to Khan, we will see it at length. So something very important. And now slowly your mind also should go up. Go up in the sense yeah, you, there is no, no question of only talking about what you see. Well, transcendental imagination will come. Yes, you have your imagination. Of course, everything starts with experience. There is no doubt about it. Well, all the artists and then, yes, all what we have painted have, yes, you have the replica, the world in front of you. But then, what you carry along with you is not the world. The idea about the world, the idea of, oh, wonderful it is. You reflect, the more you reflect, you will get fascinated. Therefore, okay, absolutely there is no connection, he says, okay. There is no connection, there is no object, says Hume, that implies the existence of another when we consider objects individually. No amount of observation of Oxygen can ever tell us that when mixed with hydrogen, it will give us water. Look at the best example to keep it in your mind. What is that? No amount of observation of oxygen can ever tell us that when mixed with hydrogen, it will give us water, water, aqua. Clear, water. We know this only after we have seen the two together. It is therefore by a quality in the objects we observe, but is rather a habit of association. So it is called the habit of, habit of association. Yes, the mind is capable of associating. Please remember. So this is the contribution of, yes, David Hume. The mind is capable of 
yes with the help of contingency continuity and priority in time and constant conjunction yes mind does the habit of association is simply a dasit in priority and in sequence and in a mutual relation you bring it and thus that is what happens okay habit of association in the mind produced by the repetition of instances of a and b yes you know how sambar is made yes is an association in the mind how fish curry is made or anything the idea yes it is already yes, now you do the experiment now in many things you will be able to go yes and if you find something other way tell me i am happy to uh, discuss with you that okay since we see sun rising in the east we make the assumption that sun rises in the east there is no reason to say that the sun cannot rise in the it's a habit of association you say yes morning you call it morning because yes you have made night and day and the dawn is called morning you don't call oh good noon in the morning but then yes in that evening we call a good evening and and a little later you call good night so that is called association habit of association look at new ideas coming in don't get perplexed to with now b b the theory of substance means two two the theory of theory of substance yes the same principle is applied here and then will come the external world okay 2 3 the external external world you see all this is a habit of association because there is a continuity priority and constant conjunction the mind is capable of associating two things together and then finds its relation apart from that and a, a thing doesn't have any connection with anything at all as these are the three the three elements that is to be discussed the first of all the theory of causality please once you study this one you can apply it to anything in the philosophy of philosophy of david hume so the theory of causality is over theory of substance again the same thing in the mind feels that yes we call it a substance now look at go back to aristotle and the all previous ones but then move what is mind we have noticed he did not say anything about the mind he doesn't say anything about mind when you come to kant you will get the power of mind clear okay now causality substance is a causality and all that is is something very important interesting we will also yes having established dualism in the for, in the field of ontology Locke post postulates that substance existing outside the mind is a stratum okay in other words in order to perceive something yes with the help of senses you perceive what is outside there is something outside yes and now berkeley said it is already in the mind and now hume will say it is only a mere association can simply draw from the major premise to the minor and to the conclusion so locke says well experience is twofold external and internal external through the senses with the, with the help of the senses you perceive what is there so in other words there is something called substance outside that is with the help of senses you take inside you reflect and thus you form ideas and then lock berkeley said well there is something 
problematic with this man because he made the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. But then, if secondary qualities are depending on the perceiving subject, primary qualities also, thus he reduced primary also into secondary. Okay, and thus when we come here, the problem is, there is no substance outside, whatever you, you feel is a kind of association, that is what is, is all about. Hume points out the substance has no existence. Substance has no existence, you need to think. Yes, objects have existence, there is no problem. It doesn't call, you need to question that. Substance, Hume points out that substance has no existence. Neither has the conscious substance. Conscious substance means mind, clear? Mind is an association with that. Okay, look at, Hume points out that substance has no existence. Neither has the conscious substance any existence. Just like the idea of causality, the idea of substance is a category of human thought. Write out. Just like the idea of causality, just like the idea of causality, comma, the idea of substance is a category of human thought. Just like the idea of causality, the idea of substance is a category of category of human thought. A category of human thought means, yes, an idea. So, when you come to Kant, yes, Kant will say, yes, you perceive things in space and time and with a category of thought, namely 12 categories. Don't write here, when we come to Kant, you will write quality, quantity, relation, mortality into three, twelve categories. Quality, quantity, relation, mortality. So in other words, well, you come to Vijnanandilayam, you stand at the entrance and you say, yes, this is the Vijnanandilayam Institute of Philosophy and Religion, the classrooms on the right and the left, yes. And then again, on the left you have the auditorium, and in the right you have the, yes, of library, and thus it becomes what happens, a category of human thought. That is the thing. No, in other words, we knew we are condemned forever to live with the categories in our mind. If I say it, well, I am perfectly okay. In other words, yes, you have, you do, how do you reflect about what, what you say about your own parents? Yes, your parents are with you. Yes, the thought of your parents. And then all what is attached will come with that. So that is human life. So in other words, Subs theory of substance is a category of human thought which cannot be philosophically justified. That's the point. Thus, yes, we cannot philosophically justify it. Yes, thus the idea of substance is a fiction. Thus the idea of substance is a Fiction according to Hume, that is the theory of substance. Again, the theory of external world, same, because external world is a, the term world is a, a category of human thought. What you find in the world is individual objects, but you put together collectively call it, yes, a what? Yes, the world. That is, yes, look at, therefore, what is to be studied in Hume is 
try to understand this theory of causality. Apply it to substance, to world. All these are categories of human thought. This is how you need to study. Once you study, Hume is with you. Clear? Yes. Ab about external world, at least one sentence we can... Yes. Yes. At least one sentence. What we can directly known are only... Yes, a problematic sentence only. Yes. What we can directly known are only our own ideas. What we can directly known is our own, only our own ideas. Our belief that things exist external to us, our belief that things, T-H-I-N-G-S, things exist external to us, Comma, says Hume, comma, is the product of our imagination. Is the product of our imagination as it deals with, as it deals with Two special characteristics of our impressions. Put a colon, what are they? Yes, our impression, yes, is the product of our imagination as it deals with two special characteristics of our impressions. Put a colon, what are they? Constancy and coherence. Constancy. C-O-N-S-T-A-N-C-Y Con Constancy and Coherence C-O-H-E-R-E-N-C-E -E. Coherence What do you mean by Constancy and Coherence? Yeah, you enter into the Mediaburan campus You look, there is a road Yes, in the either side of the roads You have the institutions You have an impression and that impression, with that impression you go, you come back again and you know where to go, how to go, because there is a constancy and coherence. After two years, Brindisi will not become MSFS college. Yes, Brindisi is Brindisi, Vianney is Vianney. Follow? So, in other words, you may change the, uh, the, uh, the what you call the name of the institution, but the institution will remain the same. Suppose after some time you say, oh, there was, this was called Vianney B, now what has happened and all that, you can ask. But then, point is, well, there is something called constancy and coherence. So, we, we have the existence of the external world precisely because our mind possesses, possesses with a yes, certain consistency and coherence in observing, observing reality. Anything for that matter. Anything. So that is his idea of, yes, again, then we come to, yeah, the next point, the philosophy of God, that we will take it in the next class, that's the best. Clear? Yes, thank you.